back to the 90s! Boom shakalaka! My calculations are correct. When this baby hits 88 miles per hour, you're gonna see some serious shit. My flows hit you at straight 88 miles per hour. That's enough to generate 1.21 gigawatts, son. And I'm on the run from the Libyans. It was a straight jack move for plutonium. And when they van rolls up, it's pandemonium. 1.18 a.m. at Twin Pines Mall is when I can pinpoint my total downfall. Now they say die. Greetings and salutations. Welcome to Nostalgia, and today I am joined by genuine icons. When I say icons, these guys are legends of the pop business. We've got Richard and Fed Fairbrass, yeah. and you guys know them as Right Said Fred. Exactly. Hello. Hello. Hey, how are you? Hi, guys. Are you? Welcome. How are you? Yeah, we're good, actually. Yes, it's a lovely day, so it helps. Yeah, not bad. Yeah, yeah. it's all right. Yeah. Just in time for the Euros, we can all hit the beer gardens. Yeah, <laughs> that's the plan. <laughs> Let me just start by saying to you guys and everybody at home, uh, happy Pride Month. That, oh, thank oh, you very okay, much. Right, yes, okay, yes, 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 I saw yes, some posts yes. on my computer yep. this morning on my phone. Yeah. yeah, I said I'll be going to Manchester in a couple of weeks. We do ah. Manchester, we do Pride properly in Manchester down Canal Street. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, we've heard. Yeah, I, I reckon it's probably better than London, isn't it? Well, I've, I've only done the Manchester, but oh, okay, it's, okay. We, it's, it's an amazing weekend. Yeah. Uh, you guys, everybody knows, right, said Fred, obviously. But everybody, I think everybody has it wrong. I think everybody thinks you guys were just an overnight sensation, you know, with, yeah. you know, I'm too sexy and, and deeply yeah. different. But you guys have been gigging and musicians since the 70s. Yes. I mean, yeah. I yes. don't want to make you guys feel old at all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, we don't. Our no, first gig was 1970. The first tour was 78. The first tour was 78. <laughs> that was with... Um, there's an there was an electronic duo um, from New York called Suicide, who were uh, who now are um, sort of seen as uh, instrumental in the electronic scene and punk scene. Yeah. At the time when we were touring with them, they were hated. <laughs> with, I, I didn't understand with, it with, at with, all. with a passion as and as usual with music journalists, they've decided to change their minds now. Yeah. And they now and I think Rolling Stone put their first album in the top 500 most influential albums of all time. Um, so we were on the road with Suicide in 78. With, through that tour, we did, um, we did a show at the factory with Joy Division, um, with um, uh, obviously with the original band with, when Ian was singing. Yeah. Um, and um, then we went on, we were different incarnations. We went in and out of crappy record deals like every other band. Yeah. Uh, and in, in the 80s, we kind, of, um, we kind of, through friends of ours, we got involved in, the, in I, I became an assistant video director. And through that, we started meeting people who would who were shooting videos and so we met we met uh, that's how Richard got his gig with David Bowie um that's how um Mick Jagger. No, David Bowie I always pronounce it wrong is it Bowie, <laughs> it's Bowie isn't it? is it Bowie or Bowie I always, I always say Bowie but then Wait, again. I said David Bowie I said yeah, <laughs> yeah. 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 Anyway, anyway we know who's <laughs> Mick Jagger yeah is that right? <laughs> yeah Mick Jagger. <laughs> Mick Jagger yeah so so we, we did we did some stuff with them uh well Richard did stuff with uh, with um David Dave Bowen, we both did something with Mick Jagger. Uh, we worked with uh, Rupert Everett on a, he had a, a short-lived music career. We then, through that, I got a gig with Bob Dylan and uh, I ended up doing, a. Um, it's part of a movie called Hearts of Fire that's a truly, truly appalling film. But it was really good fun working with Dylan, really good fun. And we did some live shows in Canada to support, to, to support that film. Um, then with that money, we, we, we moved ourselves to New York um yeah. and um, in 87 and we got signed to capital emi in new york they saw us as the next old billy idol at the time we were very sort of like <laughs> i don't know how they saw that le leathers and <laughs> you know leathers and things sort of like, to yeah, yeah I mean, really. I mean, that's what we were doing at the time we saw this commercial kind of rock thing a bit like it's sort of billy idolish you know lots of eights on the guitars and lots of big drum sounds and that sort of stuff and that deal came and went and that's when we decided to change tact and we just tack. Uh, tack. Sorry, what did I say? <laughs> tack. You know, tack. tack. Sorry about that. Tack. We're changing tack. Right. I would, I'd never describe your music as tack. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I might change tack as well. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, change tack. <laughs> and um, and we hooked up with Rob Manzoni, and we we just decided let's you know let's forget everything, everything we've been doing. Forget what Rob whatever Rob was doing. And the first sort of song that come out of that um, collaboration was "I'm Too Sexy," and um, that um, we. 
we felt very passionate about the song eventually. I and mean, it took a while to us to get our heads around it, but eventually we felt very passionate well, none, about none it. None of us had done anything like that before. No. We? we hadn't. No. Rob hadn't. No. Um, and it was, it was, I don't think it struck any, it didn't strike us that it was unusual. <coughs> to us, yes. it just seemed like a normal song to mm. us. Yeah. yeah. You know, it was only when it came out and everybody was going on and on about how unusual it was and how different it was from, from everything else that we suddenly had to rethink it. But at the time, when we, when we wrote it and recorded it, it didn't really seem that no, odd No, us. not at all. No. Also, Rob was into P-Funk, and they yeah, did some George weird Clinton. stuff, George Clinton. Uh, we, we both of us liked um, all, um, um, Cap Captain Beefheart. And through the early 70s, Richard and I were always into, when we were kids, we were always into sort of the glam stuff and a lot of the um, New York punk scene, you know, television, those sort of bands. And some of their stuff was fairly sort of left of centre, really, uh, talking heads, that sort of thing. So sexy to us wasn't really, we didn't, we didn't think it as a weird pop no, song. No. It's only when, we, when, the, when it became successful that, um, that people started telling us what, what a weird song it was. We, we never thought about it. No. Um, and we, we, it got refused by every record label. So uh, it, every record label just hated it with a passion. So it was eventually released through a plugging company. And um, uh, basically what we said to our manager, who was this young girl at the time, if you can get it onto the radio, you can manage us. That was the deal. She said, I, she thought it was a hit single. We said, well, if you get it on the radio, then, um, then you can manage us. And lo and behold, she got it on the Gary Crowley show and Summer Bass, was it? Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, to, to, anybody looking, <coughs> to anybody looking at that event, it would look like we'd come out of nowhere and the whole thing was planned. Yeah. You know, the muscles and the, and the, and the, and the I'm Too Sexy title and the video and the, it did, it had the look of something that was, that was organized. But yeah. the truth is it was complete chaos. It was absolute chaos. It really was. Our record company had never been a record company. Our manager had never been a, um, a manager before. We weren't even a proper band in as much as we were really just songwriters. Yeah. Um, and so, it, and the, the muscles thing, we'd been in the gym, we started working out in the gym in the early 80s, way before I'm Too yeah. Sexy. Yeah. Uh, the bald heads was something that we, we just- We went bald. We just, we, we just went bald. <laughs> something you know, that you can't really change. Yeah, you know, it's just, uh, yeah. so all, I can understand why people think it's a bit of a mini vanilla type thing, you know, uh, mini vanilla. Um, but it just, it, 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 it wasn't, it was, it, was, um, it was much more chaotic. Um, and when we went to the States, for instance, I think the entire sort of publicity budget for America was a uh, merch bud merchandise budget was $25,000. It's tiny. Which is not enough to get you uh, to print t-shirts in Brooklyn. Yeah. You know, so um, nobody really understood what they were, what they were doing, truthfully. Um, no. and, and least of all us, actually. Mm. So yeah. all of your hard work and trying to get it out there. Yeah, it was just, but also we'd, because we'd come up through the through gigs, we thought that's how it would work. Yeah, you know, we thought we'd be we'd do a gig go and then the we'd do another gig, do, go on the road. That's that's the process that we thought we were plugging into. Um, but when sexy happened, we became household names. We we, we, yeah. we we didn't do gigs; we just did promo. Yeah, we came. The celebrity yeah. thing wasn't something we had ever thought about. No, I mean, you think about. What would it like to be famous? Make a bit of money. But, but famous from music. And we became famous for being famous. That's what happened. Particularly yeah. in, in when we were touring through some places. Of, I mean, Sexy was number one in America. It was, a, it was a big track. But nevertheless, we, were, we ended up on TV shows where they didn't know what we did. They just knew that we'd, we were famous. That's why their bookers yeah. had booked us. So we thought after I'm Too Sexy, we would go on the road. We just thought we're going to go on the road with a band and we're going to tour the album. That's what bands do. Yeah. But that's not that's what happened. happened. We became, excuse me, we became household names, celebrities, and our lives changed out of recognition and, and not always for the better. So we, we fell out of love with the process quite quickly. Yeah, we, we were sort of like a bald male version of the Kardashians. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so it's, it's weird, like, it would have been the start of the 90s, just as that kind of whole thing was taking off. Like, yes. It rather was, than it, just it was, obviously you do Top of the Pops and then you do your tour. Now you've yeah. got to do live and kicking, you've got to do SMTV, you've got to do all these yeah. different shows, all the chat shows, everything like that. Yeah. Exactly. And also, yeah. back in the day when we started, the business had there was a process. You know, you had a you had a hit, you had a single, then you made a video, and then you did some TV, then you did a tour, and then you did another single. There was a kind of routine to it, a process. There was a, an organized people understood it. 
And then the, the minute the streaming thing happened and it all went, it, it started going digital, nobody understood what was happening. The business didn't understand it. A lot of artists didn't understand it. You know, the, suddenly you know, back in the day when we started, everybody's obsession was the midweek position yeah. in the charts. You know, what was your midweek? You, nobody talks about that now. Nobody. Yeah. You never hear the expression. So, um, it, yeah, it changed, it changed for everybody, not just artists, but obviously the labels, management, promoters, everything. It, ch it changed the whole system. Um, and, and I think the business is still recovering to mm. some extent. It's yeah. like still trying to find its feet, you know. Well, now you've got Spotify and all yeah. this. And yep. it, exactly. It's a very different uh, it's, it's, it's a landscape, as they say. One of the things that Mick Jagger once said, and I think he's absolutely right, he said, there's never been a better time for making music, music now, but never been a worse time for making money out of it. Yes. And I think that's true. Mm. I think that's Although they, they don't st struggle in that I, area. I don't think the Stones struggle. Although they <laughs> now they're not allowed to play live, that yeah. might make a big difference. Yes. But, um, yeah. Yeah. but I think that's true. I think it, I mean it's very easy. You know, you can put your you can put your music on this thing, yeah. in a heartbeat. Mm. Um, but actually, making money out of it is a very very different thing. Yeah. I mean, I'm prime example. I mean, I've got a nine to five job. I've, I've got a family, and then yeah. I've got furloughed. You know, sent home whilst the pandemic was on. Yeah. yeah. How am I going to fill my time? And I thought about doing this for a long time. And now I'm like, yeah, yeah. well, it's 2021, you know, I could do everything on my phone, laptops, you know, you don't exactly. have to have big cameras nowadays. You know, that's no, the no. thing, you know, people can make their music. It's all on the phone, you know. Exactly. It is, exactly. yeah. I mean, it, it is sort of genre dependent a little bit. I mean, if you're a rock band, you, you kind of need to set up in a live room in the studio, if that's yeah. how you record. Yes, yes. Uh, if you're a DJ, you can probably work from home on your computer. Or dance. Or dance music, yeah. So it sort of depends what you're doing. But um, I, I mean, certainly from our perspective, we're a pop band and we we do use a, a proper studio. You know, when I say proper, I mean like a... Like a it's got electricity in it. <laughs> it's got electricity <laughs> and running water. And running water, you know. yeah. Um, yeah. Because yeah. we, we kind of like using live drums. We, we've always used a lot of live drums. And uh, although, I mean, some stuff now is done, done remotely when we have brass. Sometimes we use brass. That's done on a remote session. So they, they just send us the stems. Um, so it depends how you work, but you're right. I mean, if, if, if you're a one-man band, uh, you can sit at home and record and release pretty much in one day. But for, for young, which is, which is amazing. For rock bands, it's a nightmare. I mean, it, yeah, it, you it, know, is, it yeah. really is. I mean, and also I think we, it's really important not to get into the mind space of thinking that it's okay not to have an audience in front of you. It's not okay. Yeah. It's, it's really, really bad for the arts. And this whole process, I mean, speaking as a, as a musician, that this whole process is a disaster for the for the performing arts completely. There's no upside to it whatsoever, other than the fact that we can zoom and we don't have to fly to you know wherever it is to do an interview, or we don't have to drive into London to one of these like Blue Buddha, you know, where you have the the ISDN line and all that kind of yeah. stuff. We can do zoom from home. It's, all that's great, but it's people seem to think that it's kind of a, well we can do zoom gigs and we can do you know, isolated gigs and then set, and people separated at table. No, 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 you can't. It's rubbish. ACDC yeah. need the punters right in front of them, climbing on top of each other. And so do a lot about a lot of other bands. And I mm. think it's, it's, it really irritates me when mm. people think it's kind of getting back to normal. It is not. Well, for yourselves, it's not that long until you're going to be back in front of us. I mean, I've got you down in Germany in August. Well, yeah, these these, these are, are these shows won't happen. I don't think uh, so. Because all the time the government has a quarantine um, po policy, uh, bands like us can't fly in and fly out. It's impossible. Yeah, really? uh, yeah, you can't. Well, we you, can't. We'd have to because every time you do a gig, you got you got to quarantine for ten days. Yeah, not just us, the everybody, whole crew. The whole crew. We would then drivers, everybody. Yeah, yeah, we would then have to pay for the whole crew. <laughs> so not not, work, for not work for 10 days. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, it's laughable. It's, it and is. we keep getting offered shows, and I keep going back to our agent. We can't do this. How's it going to work? If the government change policy, which they might, but the thing is, you, you can't trust them. And as we've seen in Portugal recently, imagine if you're a band and you had a Portugal gig set up. And you did lots of rehearsals. And you, and you just spent your five grand on pre-pro, whatever, whatever you're doing, or two grand, whatever you spend on pre-production. And then suddenly the show's cancelled. You've just gone down a few grand. Yeah. You're not going to get paid. Yeah. And so when people talk about it getting back to normal, they really haven't done their homework. And, I, and even artists I know, I'm seeing it online, you know, quite well-known bands are putting sh um, tour dates up. And I'm just thinking, who's telling them this? Yeah. Because and what makes me nervous is maybe that maybe the promoter wants the money in the bank That's what I think. and they just reschedule the show. That's what I think. Maybe. I'm not... Accusing them of that. Oh, yes, I am. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
uh, I'm just saying it's possible because at the moment it is impossible. Uh, we would have to say to, to the promoter, the money you're paying us uh, is fine, but can you add an extra, you know, 20, 20 grand or, all the tests, or whatever for the, for the tests, hotel delays for 10 people not working for 10 days? Yeah. Can you yeah. pay us for that? And he would tell us to. <laughs> well, we, we were talking to a guy the other day and he was he was involved in the theatre. I think it was a theatre and that they'd done rehearsals and the whole thing was about to go. And then one person in, in, a, in a crew of about 30 people tested positive on the PCR test, which is notoriously unreliable anyway. And the whole thing's off. Yeah. yeah. One thing's off. yeah. So, so, what, so yeah. sorry, but what insurance company is going to insure a show that might get pulled at the last minute? Yeah. You know, what promoter is going to in, indulge in the kind of costs that it's that's involved in PCR tests, in extended quarantines, in all that. It's just a nonsense. It's a nonsense. Yeah, it won't, it, it won't work. So, no. I mean, from our perspective, what we're working on now is there's a new um, thing called uh, basically you've heard of Bitcoin cryptocurrency. There's now a thing called crypto art, which which is referred to as NFTs. And that means non-fungible tokens. It all gets a bit complicated. But basically what it means is that, an, is that artists like us can make a very short piece of work. You can put it onto an NFT platform and you can, you can try and sell it. Now, you're not guaranteed to sell it, but what it gives you is an opportunity to sidestep radio, sidestep all the usual channels, and it gives you another possible revenue. And so from our, from our perspective, an independent artist, we are just putting different ideas out there. And uh, because we don't think shows will be manageable, well, possibly next year, more likely 2023. That, that's our personal opinion. Doesn't mean we're right. That's, that's what we think. But then if you believe the Great Reset, 2023 is when stage one is, <laughs> stage <laughs> one is over yeah. and stage two begins. Yeah, so, yeah. I, you know, I think it's, it's, it, you, you can only ever trust your gut. And for our position is if, if doing a gig, it's going to cost us any more money than it would normally do. We don't do it. We don't do it. No, no. Yeah. That, 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 that's, that's our position. That's, that's our position. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. So, can we go back to uh, the 90s? Yes, we yeah, can. we can. We took a bit of diversion there. <laughs> uh, obviously, I'm Too Sexy kicks it all off. And yep. then, Deeply Deeply, Don't Talk, Just Kiss. And then, yes. my personal favorite, You're My Mate. Okay. Uh, okay. Obviously, you guys. Right had an amazing career throughout the 90s into yes. the 2000s. Yep. You sang in front of the Queen and Nelson Mandela. That's like yeah. this. Yes. Yeah. We, we were uh, very lucky. We got involved in um, some good projects some good tours with, with the Nelson Mandela project. That was called Hunger First. And after apartheid finished, we, us and Arrested Development were the first two bands invited into South Africa. And we and that, and then we got went on to work with the Nelson Mandela um, project um, in Soweto, which was which was hunger first. And we went back there in two thousand and two or three, wasn't it? I can't oh, remember. I can't remember yeah, that. three. Uh, I yeah, and uh, that was that was they're, yeah, they're just really interesting things to be part of. Uh, met the Queen at the uh, Royal uh, Royal Variety performance. Yep. But the, the, I mean, the things that yeah, that's funny. Yeah, the things that for us in those during those periods that. You remember the most as an example we went to a school in hanover talking about you're my mate and they had the whole literally almost the whole school it was a dance school there was about 150 of them they had all choreographed for the, all of them a dance routine for you're my mate so we went down all, to, all ages yeah all, like from, from five-year-olds to 17 year olds yeah, yeah. and we went down there and watched them and that for me those are the moments that really really oh, stick yeah, yeah, amazing. Yeah. I mean, you know, all the other stuff, you know, Top of the Pops is nice and all that, but it, it comes and goes. But when you deal with people's lives and emotions, it's really, really important. One of the things yeah. about Top of the Pops, when we, first, when we first went to Top of the Pops, the very first time, uh, we bumped into David Bowie. And obviously prior to that, I'd done videos with him. And uh, uh, yeah, and he, uh, he looked at me and he said, what are you doing? I, said, I think he thought I was making the we were making the tea or sweeping up. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, we've got a hit record, you cheeky devil. What are you talking about? So, uh, yeah, so we, it, I mean, there are lots of little memories that you have uh, like that. Um, but yeah, that, that, that early part, as you say, with um, Don't Talk, well, Don't Talk Just Kiss was really important yeah. because it stopped us being a one hit wonder. Uh, it, it, we went from uh, I'm Too Sexy, following that up was actually quite psychologically quite tricky because we didn't want to copy the song. 
we wanted something different and, and uh, we didn't we just didn't want to look like we were you know aping ourselves mm. so don't talk to this kiss came out and that was number two i think um and i think I think Queen was number one, wasn't it? Was it I think Queen? we were number three. Oh, we were number three. They were number two. And uh, KLF. KLF was number one. Yeah, that's right. right. You know, that's yeah, right. Yeah, good song. Yeah, and then and then Dippy Dippy after that. But mm. deep, deep, in a way, don't talk. It gets overlooked a little bit. Don't talk. But that was the key oh, track. Yeah. In yeah. a way, mm. to, to to launching a career that lasted longer. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we had a massive battle with the record company because they wanted the second single to sound like I'm Too Sexy. Yeah. So they kept on sending us these horrible songs. Which we refused to do. One of them was called Suntan. Suntan, which, yeah. Which they originally, which they finally <laughs> released under another name, and it, and it just crashed on its oh, ass. Yeah. I'm pleased to say. Yeah. Um, um, and but we we at the, we were fortunate because Ampli Sex was so successful, and um, particularly abroad, um, that we, we had, had some leverage. we had some leverage, and we yeah. could say, no, we're going to write this song, and and we we we're, we're going to make this work. So so don't talk to Kiss was was that was that song. Yeah. And um, and in all fairness to our manager, she she came up with the idea of giving the you know in terms of for the media giving the whole project a bit of a twist. We um, we did a we, we featured Jocelyn Brown. Yeah. yeah, and that was a really good idea because it, it gave it, it brought in a different audience. Shot, it changed the look of the, the, the band for one 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 record, and yeah. that was a, that was a neat idea. So that was uh, Tamton, our manager, came yeah. up with that idea. With Deeply Dippy, the label, the record label, wanted it to be a four on the floor dance song. Yeah, and so <laughs> to make that work, <laughs> to make that work, <laughs> it runs at about 180 BPM. So. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, you know. So they didn't even want it on the album. You know, it was ridiculous. It's. You know? uh, I think throughout in life generally, you can trust. I hate to say this, but you can trust the people on the street much more than you can self-elected experts and, and record company, company people. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. and with, with as you're, if you're an artist, the only audience that matters is the audience in front of you. That's the only audience that matters. Mm. Everything else is just talk. Well, I've been to you guys twice now, and I can tell everybody it is a brilliant gig. Like, oh, thank you. Thank thanks. You. Um, thank you. I mean, speaking of gigs, yes, the World Cup opening ceremony. Yes, yes in Berlin. 200,000 people, is that right? Yes. I think it was more, actually. I think and they were all in our dressing room. <laughs> <laughs> it, was a, it, it was a big after show. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think it was more, actually, because it went right down. They, 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 for people who don't know, the brand, they, we had it, they held it at the Brandenburg Gate. And we played that a few times for New Year's Eve and other sh other festivals, and it went down a couple of miles, and mm. it was it was you couldn't see that it was just ridiculous. And I think it was, yeah, I think maybe two or three hundred thousand, but it was a lot of people. Yeah. And um, that was sort of the that that was the official opening for the, for the fans. They did an official opening for TV in the stadium, and then they did a, uh, they, for the football fans. They we at the time we had a song called Stand Up for the Champions. It was a massive sport picked up by all the football teams. They still teams. play it, um, at the NFL. Um, yeah, yes, they do. Yes. It's, 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 it's always been a, a very popular sports song. So um, we got picked because that because they were using Stand Up in the World Cup. Um, and it is amazing when you see 200 odd thousand people doing Stand Up like that. That's, it it, that was quite an amazing feeling. So um, yeah, some of those gigs have been, they're very memorable. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I, 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 we, we miss Germany, actually. At least I yeah, do. Yeah. Uh, we went, we, we were, you know, we've been going there since 1992, 91. And, um, and obviously because of all this nonsense, uh, flying to Germany and flying in out and doing shows has become impossible. So, and I miss it. Um, when we did the gig at the Brandenburg Gate, the most amazing thing for me was you can still see bullet holes in the stonework. Yeah. The second war. Amazing. amazing. Yeah, amazing. Yeah. I mean, it's all things like that. I mean, do you guys I mean you've been you'd never stopped touring really until last year? No. <laughs> no. Mean, no. Do you guys get time to, you know, go out and enjoy yourselves, or is it literally finish the gig on to the next place? Yeah. You get time to actually feel things like that. Yeah, yeah, we do. We 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 make sure that we don't tour too much. We we don't we're not one we're not a touring band. We would just go out and do a May to September sort of run, you know, generally. Well, pop bands tend to be like that. Y yes, I mean, they? yeah, we occasionally we go out in the winter and we do a run through Germany, Austria, and it was it was called the, um, what was it, in the snow, it was fun in the snow or rock in the snow or something, or something, <laughs> something, 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 something snow. Yes, and, yes, uh, something and, snow. and sometimes we used to do that, and quite a few bands do, there was Brian Adams out there and all sorts of, and Simply Red, all sorts of bands do that. That, those sort of runs yeah um but we, we do take time to um to, you know to go, you know, go down the gym and spend time with our families and you know we aren't uh, we aren't workaholics at mm. all one of the downsides well, downsides of, of doing the couple of gigs gigging as often as we were 
is you tend to stop thinking about the writing. Yeah, you do. The, right, the writing of the song tends to take second place to pleasing the audience on a Friday night or a Saturday night. And so under normal circumstances, you know, let's say we had a show on a Saturday night, we'd, be, we'd fly out on very early on a Saturday morning, do the show Saturday night, get back knackered on Sunday, have, another, have a rest on Monday, maybe think about it a little bit or go to the gym Tuesday, Wednesday, and then you're, you're thinking about the next show. So yeah. this, the lockdown, the upside of it, and I wouldn't recommend it as therapy, but the upside of it for us has been that we've been forced into thinking about the writing. And I think the writing that we're doing now is probably the best stuff we've done for f five, 10 years. Mm, long time, yeah. 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 Can't wait to hear it. Yeah. And now, singing in front of 200, 300,000 people is pretty good. But yes. You know when you've made it big? When you have your own annual. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, I might have to explain to some people on YouTube what an annual is nowadays. <laughs> everybody had an annual. In yes. the, have you guys ever seen this before? Yes, yes, yes we yes, have. Yes, we, yes, have. Yeah, we signed a few copies. We signed a few copies. Yeah, we, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. People don't do annuals anymore, I don't think. Yeah, they but, don't. No, no. no. <laughs> one, of the, one of the problems, I think, with streaming and, and the way people listen to music now, is they, is they tend to listen to tracks rather than artists. Yes, they do. You know, mm. so, I mean, we heard a story, I don't know whether this is true, but we heard a story of people at, at a festival. What people would do is they would Shazam, the band that was currently on, wait for their favorite song to come up, go down the front, <laughs> listen to their favorite song and, and go back to the tent. <laughs> they don't stand there, yeah, they don't stand mm. there for the whole yeah. half hour they, mm. because they, they're addicted to their song. Yeah, yeah. So people are listening to music in a different way, I think. Yes, they um, are. And when I was, a, you know, back in the, Fred's daughter was at my at my house a few about a year or so ago, and I had all my albums, my my vinyl albums, all stacked up, you know. And she she looked at me and she said, "What are they?" So I said, <laughs> "Well, they're albums." Mm. And she said, "Well, what do they do?" So I explained, "You need to put the needle on, blah blah." And then she said, "Well, how many artists on there?" So I said, "One." <laughs> she couldn't <laughs> she couldn't process it. I told yeah. a thing this big that would only have one artist on it. Yeah. Well, she's used to having one of these with 10,000 artists mm. on it. So, you know what I miss? I miss, like, I'm, I'm 35, but when you used to get cassettes like uh, Michael Jackson's Dangerous, for example, you'd open the cassette and you could pull it out, there'd be like a little leaflet with all the lyrics and everything yeah. inside it. Yeah, and I yeah, miss yeah. things like that. I mean, I, I mean, it's great technology in 2021. You want to listen to a song, bang, there it is. YouTube, yes. Spotify, whatever you want, it's all at your fingertips. But, you know, sitting down, putting it on, going through the little albums and getting your annuals out and things like that it's yeah, yeah. it made you just it made you feel it you know like like it was touching it does and also the one, one of the, one of the biggest sadnesses about the way music is uh, you receive music now is a lot of the people in the back room you know the producers the engineers the you know the 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 t-boy or what all the other people behind the scenes don't get a mention no. it's the song title uh, the band maybe the writers if you're lucky yeah. and yeah. that's about it Whereas back, I remember buying a Steely Dan album and on the back, it actually listed all the equipment they used in the studio. Every mm. microphone, every drum, everything, mm. you know. The, the, and the, it's, inter it's interesting, it's interesting. There's a new um, uh, co company called Viva Collect, V-E-V-A, and they do merchandise and on the back, it's a credit for all the people involved in the song. So, so, so it's to try and revive the credit mentality. So we've, we've just done up some merch with them. Yeah. And it's really cool. So if you've got a song you really like, go on Viva Collect, see if, see if they do it. And you can buy that, the T-shirt or whatever, with that song on it. And it tells you everyone involved. It's, and it's, it's quite a nice idea. It's yeah. Really, when friend's mm -hmm. girlfriend some years ago heard Knock Knock Knocking on Heaven Door, Heaven's Door, she thought that um, Axel Rose. Axel Rose wrote it. Mm. I, I had to explain you know, to her. But that's... Uh, in, Big, big letters. <laughs> yeah. And so, I'm a Bob Dylan fan. Yeah, exactly. So <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it is strange the way people access music now. Um, yeah, yeah. And uh, I think there's a, there is definitely um, something lost when you, don't, when you don't eagerly go to the shop and wait for the album and you take the album home, look at all the sleeve notes, drop the needle on your favourite solo, you know, and all that stuff, you know. Well, I can, I'm 35 and I had a handful of LPs growing up and... My first ever LP was the Mr. Blobby song, so <laughs> my credibility when it comes to LPs is <laughs> <Okay>. strongest. <laughs> I had Wham, uh, Paul Rabdul, and Mr. Blobby. So, oh, <laughs> Rab yeah. oh yeah, I love Paul Rabdul. Still do. Yeah, yeah. yeah Paul Rabdul. Can't remember that. Yeah, last week. <laughs> yeah. All right, guys, I want to thank you so much for joining me. Pleasure. Guys, pleasure. I don't understand how much this means to me and everybody watching. You guys want to tell right said Fred how much you love him. Deeply dip into the comment section. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, well, I'm too sexy for this YouTube video. 
Thank, thank you, you so much, guys. Pleasure. Thank you so thank much. Thank you very much. Cheers. Take thank care. You. Cheers. Wow. Right, said bloody Fred. Massive thank you to Fred and Richard for taking the time out to speak to us. And a big thank you to Lisa over at Lisa Davis Promotions for hooking us up with Right Said Fred and arranging everything. It is absolutely insane to me. This channel only got launched just over a month ago. And I've already spoken to a Mighty Duck, a Star Trek crew member, Right Said Bloody Fred. And it isn't down to me. It's down to you guys. All your views, comments, shares, your subscribing. This wouldn't have been possible without all of you. Not just liking the videos and stuff like that, but all the support that you've given me as well. And I sure as hell don't plan on stopping anytime soon. I've got another interview lined up for the next couple of days. That'll be uploading next week. This is going to be a scorcher. And then I've got another two lined up for the end of June. And it's not just the special guests. I've got another top 10 favourite list coming at you in a couple of days. And I've had me jabs. I'm venturing out. We're going to be going out treasure hunting. We're hitting up charity shops and car boots and finding all sorts of old school toys and games. Jackpot! We're going to be taking a trip to Friends Fest in Manchester. And then we're going to all around the country hitting up all the Comic Cons. Wales, Stoke Con, Manchester... We're going to have loads of content for you guys, but it might seem a bit quiet on here for a couple of days and that's because the Euros are kicking off. I want to watch some football and have some beers, but don't worry, we'll still be uploading some content. So till next time guys, make sure that you comment on the videos, let us know the kind of guests I should be booking. Love you guys. Peace out.